Thank you very much for the invitation uh, in this lovely session. Very excited to be here. And uh, in, prefer in preparation for my talk, I, uh, what I've been doing is, I have nothing to disclose, I've been uh, asking around about how surgeons perceive artificial intelligence and how do they think and if they think they will have an impact on their job as surgeons. And most of the people that were interviewed using web search, which is our virtual university, said yes, I think it, it will have an impact and yes, it will be for the better. Only a few of them thought that they would steal, AI would steal their job. But 75% of them really admitted that could not define the fundamentals of AI. So after this morning, uh, I hope that the surgeons, at least those in the room, will know more about artificial intelligence. And we had so much repetition, and we will have so much repetition with my talk, that for sure you will know more about artificial intelligence. But for those who are concerned that AI will steal their jobs away, we are really, really far from that. We're still working with narrow AI, with systems that are capable of doing what we do, almost what, what we do, and certainly we are, we are not yet uh, in, a, in an era where uh, robots and machines can solve any intellectual uh, problems and can actually take our place. But what we have to acknowledge, and I'm very happy that I have uh, Professor Satava in, uh, in the room, and if I could advance my slide, that doesn't work, is that we really change uh, how we see medicine and how we see surgery. We moved from an industrial age to an information age. And I'm very happy that you're here because I think you were the pioneer of AI back at that time 30 years ago. And a lot of this is happening because of what you uh, told us. So if we can uh, maximize imaging support and the data that we have in the OR when we operate, we have high quality images and real time information, certainly we can make a difference in the way we deliver care. Our surgery can be more accurate, we can decrease the collateral trauma, we can decrease potentially the number of complications that we have. And there is a lot of technology in the OR today. We are working with uh, a lot of machines that produce a lot of data. We are doing lots of things differently. We we're doing laparoscopy, robotic surgery, we're doing endoscopic surgery, we're doing percutaneous surgery. So the way we, we deliver surgery changed. And we're using different kind of images at the same time while we operate, and that allow, uh, adds another set of data that we have to interpret and we have to learn and we have to uh, uh, really teach uh, to our juniors and uh, help understand how we can use this kind of information. But we also have a constant technological and intellectual evolution. We change the way we approach diseases. And if we think about cholecystectomy, and I wanted a little bit to provoke with this slide, over the past 30 years it changed. We went from open cholecystectomy to laparoscopic cholecystectomy. 15 years ago we tried to do nodes cholecystectomy through the natural orifice. In some cases now we do endoscopic cholecystectomy or uh, uh, clear of the stones in the, uh, in the, in the gallbladder, we could, we could do it uh, through a stent that prevents the stones from migrating. So there is a lot of constant evolution which produces a lot of different ways of analyzing and collecting data in the OR. We're mixing specialties. We are changing the ecosystem and the environment in which we work. We work with different teams, surgeons and interventional radiologists, surgeons and endoscopists, surgeons that use those different tools. So everything is hybrid today in our ORs. We are also borrowing stuff and technologies from other specialties that have nothing to do with abdominal or thoracic surgeons, such as systems like this one for stereotactic navigation that is used for neurosurgery. We are using it for pelvic navigation and uh, for uh, rectal surgery. So it's, it's a, lot of, a, a lot of things that might be confusing. And then we have the anesthesiologist, and then we have other machines that produce more data that are important for the patients to uh, undergo the operation in a very 
safe environment. And all of this also has to include education, interpretation of the data that we use, and possibly also uh, storage of data for future use. And, uh, and uh, uh, really what happened is that over the past 30 years, surgery became something that is extremely complex and potentially dangerous. And up to 60% of medical error actually happen in the OR. The other thing that nobody mentioned yet, but to me is very, very important, is surgeons have a certain personality. We do have a personality, and we don't like to admit failure. We don't like to report errors. We don't like to report a complication. And what I mean by that is we don't like to publish on complication. Very rarely we do so. And very rarely we also put in place systems that will allow us to correct the mistakes that we make. So that is something that really should, we should take into account. And artificial intelligence could help us to do that because it can sense, it can extract the uh, useful information and can assist us while we operate. So if I had to talk about the application, potential application of AI in surgery, it could support surgical decision making, improve surgical precision, improve the workflow, increase surgical safety, probably it could reduce some manpower, and in the, in the future, in the very far future, could have some autonomous function. But when Oz asked me to give this talk about the current application, of AI in surgery. This was my answer, a blank slide, because we don't have any. And Theodore Grantroff gave a grand lecture. I loved it. But today, we have nothing that really is being used currently every day in our OR. There are a lot of things that we're working on. And you've seen multiple presentations on procedure duration prediction, gesture recognition, interpretation of surgical phase, surgical skills in endoscopy, in laparoscopy, and in, of course in other surgical and medical specialties. So what we did, as everybody else in the field, we focused on cholecystectomy, and why that? Because cholecystectomy is the most commonly performed procedure, because cholecystectomy is supposed to have very well standardized, easy rules, the CVS, the critical view of safety, that dates now more than 30 years back, first published in 95. But when you really go and look at what surgeons do in everyday life, as we did a couple of years ago, really asking the surgeons to take a five seconds break in order to identify and confirm with their assistant the CVS, the achievement of the critical view of safety. And we looked at the data of, uh, coming from the video of the year before and the year after of the, uh, um, of the institution of this five second rule. What we found out is that Amazingly enough, about 50% of surgeons, and we're talking about junior surgeons, senior residents, attendings, only 16% achieved the CVS. So this data is sharing, disclosing something that to me is extremely embarrassing, but when you look at the literature around the world, the mean achievement is 9%. So, we were not doing so bad, but if you think about it as a patient's pers perspective, it's not 100%, but it's not even 50%. So we have a problem. But what's interesting is that when the five-second rules was introduced, it went up to 44%. So we are humans, we can learn from our mistakes. Three months after, we looked again at the data, and there was a drop to 20%. So we learn and we forget. This is how humans function. So probably this is the most important piece of information of this work. We need to be reminded, even for simple things, and to have uh, some kind of intraoperative assistance in order to perform well. 
Uh, these slides have been shown before. This is the very early work uh, from the team, uh, the CAMA team, Nicolas Padua, then Pietro Mascani joined, uh, really to establish the surgical workflow uh, of the uh, surgeon performing a gallbladder surgery. You can see it here. And this is a video, I think, that dates back 15 years. So very, very early work, just to tell you how long it takes in order to achieve uh, good results in this particular field. So what the team did is also went to uh, the automatic assessment of the critical view safety at uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy using deep learning. And they did this, of course, analyzing still Im images first and then videos. But what is very interesting is that they can do it live. The computer is capable today, and I'm, I will try to make it play, fantastic, to do it real time while the video is playing, which is a gigantic step towards the implementation of this kind of support during an actual operation live. And this is the first video of a live procedure that we did during the AES meeting in Barcelona just uh, at the end of last year, showing the use of artificial intelligence in order to annotate automatically, identify the structure of the uh, critical view of safety. So this is something that probably in the next couple of years will be in your R and probably will help uh, you uh, have a better success in achieving the CVS, not 14, but probably 50 or more. And if you want to try if this works, you can scan the QR code and you can log on to the uh, website. You can drop your image and see if the, uh, if the machine can analyze your work. Or you can go and ask Pietro for more details. Other, other group have done the same thing. This is the work from Amin Madani, uh, which is, uh, I think, a further simplification of what we have done. You really have go and no go zone. It's fantastic, it's fantastic for residents because I feel personally when I teach us sometimes, even if you tell this is this and this is that, it's better to have red and, and green zone for them to start operating and really know here you cannot really go and here is safe to, uh, to operate. What our team did too, and in particular Pietro did too, is digest a surgical video in order to extract only the part that are interesting, the difficult part of a procedure. Of course, this is again based on cholecystectomy because of the previous work that had been done, but potentially this could be applicable uh, to any particularly technically difficult step standardizable of a procedure. And what it was possible to do is not only to automatically extract the sequence of the, uh, the, assess the achievement of the um, critical view of safety, but also understand, the machine could understand whether the CVS was achieved or not. This is very important for also surgical reports and annotation, because if you looked at the um, surgical reports of cholecystectomy, even when objectively the CVS was not achieved, everybody wrote that they did see the elements of the CVS and that it was achieved. So this brings something that is an objective evaluation of what is done in the OR, which is not a threat to the surgeon, actually is a tool that could help you progress and could protect you against uh, potential, potential complaints in, um, in the future. I'm very happy to show you something that hasn't been shown in the morning since now. Maybe somebody else will, but not up to now. I really insist on uh, having uh, our team work on something different from cholecystectomy. And I pick a, a procedure, we as a team picked a procedure that is very common, because you have 20 million hernia repair performed by, uh, by, by per year. And the uh, tap repair is something that is very well standardized. So similar to what you would do with call a cystectomy, we identify the different steps and phases of the procedure. And then what we did is uh, teach the, uh, the, uh, the computer, the machine, uh, if there were no dissection, partial dis dissection, or complete dissection. But in order to do, to do this, we had to provide the, uh, the important visual clues and important elements to establish if a complete dissection, which means ready to place the mesh, basically, was achieved identifying the, the surgical landmark and anatomical landmark that you can see here to do so. And you can see that this is a live um, uh, procedure where we can see that every single element that needs to be there is identified. This is one of the first videos 
but it is possible to do this in real time. And this is important because we, we were talking about education. If you use this kind of approach, what you can tell your trainee is you're good at ABC, but you have to work more on other steps of the procedure so that they can really personalize their learning curve and speed up the learning curve. What we did also is looked at uh, uh, idle time, things where nothing is happening in the OR. And this might seem something you know, that you put aside, but how many of you have been waiting for minutes, sometimes 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get an insurance or to get a mesh in the OR. So this is something that can really improve the way we, we perform surgery. Very understandable not only to surgeons but to hospital administrators and personnel. We can tell also skills and performance because it's very easy to understand if a surgeon is skilled or uh, 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 and tell the difference with if a trainee is performing the procedure. I do a lot of uh, endoscopic surgery, and I do a lot of bariatric endoscopic procedure, and I love it because I think that can, I can target 95% of the bariatric population that cannot or doesn't want to have a surgery. So it's a huge, gigantic market, but the results are good, but all over the place. Why? Because we are very creative. Uh, Theodore was saying that there is going to be more mathematics and less art and creativity. Here we are in a world of creativity. Everybody wants to have a particular pattern or wants to sign the procedure. In reality, we have to understand how to do this uh, well because it's something that is extremely useful for patients. How do we do that? with AI, because we can ap apply AI model in order to understand which patients are more suitable for this operation, looking at the preoperative data. We can also use intraoperative data to analyze pattern, and we can use postoperative data. So we can predict the success of, a, of, of the procedure, and this um, uh, is something that we are working on right now. We could also analyze what's going on in the OR. We talked about how complex is the OR environment today, how many people People walk in and uh, how many different uh, teams can be um, doing uh, the, the procedure at the same time in the OR. We can look at things that the naked eye cannot perceive, like radiation exposure. We're, we have hybrid ORs at our centers. We're working a lot with different machinery, the Fino, the, uh, the CD scan, or the simple CR. And this is something that uh, needs uh, to be assessed and analyzed to protect the patient, to protect the personnel. And we can, we can also use AI to do that. So in the end, we, AI models can improve the way we perform surgery with safety alerts, no-go zones, uh, difficulty notifications, staff notification, auto reports. It can improve the competency of uh, the, um, the, the trainees and the trainers also, uh, the learning curve, and provide constructive, personalized live feedback to them, and also the world of education in general. There are some obstacles and perils, as Dana Shimoto would say. Physician resistant, some. I have to say that everybody's pretty much enthusiastic about AI. Maybe don't know what it is, but the enthusiasm is there. Enthusiasm is there. Limited quantity of available video. I had the chance and the honor to speak at MGA just uh, uh, last week, and I was really uh, surprised uh, by the fact that recording clinical videos, even in another institution in the US and in all over the world, is not something that is done automatically. Uh, we, are, we come from an institution where everything is recorded. So to me, it was very interesting to see that this is not the case everywhere. And probably I think SAGES can really help with that. Who owns the data, the regulation, the liability, the privacy issue, the lack of reimbursement? Who's paying to have this assistance system in the OR? And then the culture definitely needs to change. So here is my guess and my wish for next year. I hope that next year in this session, if I, if I run again my survey and ask, what do you think uh, is the impact of AI in surgery, everybody will say yes, it, there is an impact and yes, it is positive. But also 100% of you, after so much repetition and uh, so many great speakers, will be able to define what are the fundamental elements of AI and how you can implement it into your clinical practice. Last but not least, 
Uh, if you want to learn more, please do join our summer school on surgical data science. Uh, if you want to know more, go contact Pietro or scan the QR code. Thank you very much.